Leslie, first of all, I just may ask you a, a few questions about the film. I suppose the um, uh, obvious one, and uh, uh, forgive me if you've been asked this a million times, um, I suppose the obvious one is um, why this particular case? Uh, it, because it, it's obviously a, an atrocious crime. It obviously garnered a huge amount of uh, support, captured all sorts of imaginations and protests in India. But there are many other crimes uh, which have captured that sort of uh, support and outrage. So why did you find an interest in this particular case? It was entirely, forgive me by the way, um, I've been doing press for four days no. and I haven't slept for four days. Oh. <laughs> so the voice goes first. Um, <coughs> But um, I should just say I'm hoarse, but not gagged. So why, why this um, set of circumstances? It was undoubtedly the response to this crime and not the crime itself. Um, I know enough about unfortunately, about violent rapes, thank you so much, around the world, to know that this particular gruesome, heinous crime was the tip of an iceberg. It was the response to it that so inspired me, so moved me. It seemed to me that in my lifetime, which as you can see is a long one, <laughs> I had never seen any other country stand up with such fortitude, with such courage mm. for my rights as a woman. <clears throat> and it seemed to me that India was actually leading the world by example in those momentous protests, the unprecedented numbers of mm. men and women out on those streets. Mm. And in such a sustained way, it wasn't for a day or a week, it was for over a month, it was across a number of cities. And I just thought if those people could stand out there so bravely and hopefully crying, enough is enough, the least I could do was do what I do as my metier, which is make films and amplify those voices with a film. That's why. What's your reaction now to the recent banning of your film in India? Well, that question absolutely um, follows um, beautifully and with great irony what I've just said, because my whole purpose here was to give a gift of gratitude to India, mm. to actually praise India, to single India out as a country that was exemplary in its response to this rape, as a country where one could actually see change beginning, and indeed it, it did continue through the Verma report in that month of January. And the supreme irony is that they are now accusing me of having wanted to point fingers at India, defame India, and it is they who have committed international suicide mm -hmm. by banning this film. Yeah. It is they who are bringing India into disrepute mm. by stamping on the primary tenet of any democracy, free speech. Mm. It's a tragedy. Mm. And if there is anybody in this room who knows anyone, who knows Modi or who knows Cameron, who thinks we might somehow be able to get me on the phone to Modi. I mean, I, I really believe I can persuade him because his home minister has made an absolute idiot of himself. He has not been briefed remotely well. He has been fed a pack of lies. I have just gone on NTTV and published the prison permissions. They are cast iron. I have complied in every respect with those permissions. And he stood in front of the Lok Sabha and, and I stood aghast, hearing inaccuracy after inaccuracy. I mean, the man was left, you know, peddling a bunch of pathetic lies. Mm. So, 
You know, I cannot believe that Modi, who has made no statement at all yet, if he spent one hour seeing this documentary, he would see his own statements since he got into power reflected in this film. Mm. The film is saying exactly what he's saying with his Betty Bachao um, campaign. It's just, I mean, I, I'm speechless. Yeah. I'm still reeling in shock. Well, I, I'm not surprised you, you've had a very, um, you've had a very hectic, using the typical English understatement, a hectic few days. <laughs> um, we, we've sort of noticed so what's happening now. Okay, okay, it's now been bad, right? Fine, but, um, but luckily you're surrounded by lawyers, so you're, 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 you're fine. You're fine. You're in the right place. Um, but perhaps if we could just expand a little bit, um, if I if I can bring in um, Tanya uh, and then perhaps expand to to everyone else and. and questions um, from all of you here. I mean, Tanya, why, why did you, on behalf of Plan UK, um, why did you get involved with this film? Well, I, I was just so astonished when I suddenly heard from Leslie what, what she was doing. Um, Plan, you know, has for the last, oh gosh, six years been running a huge global campaign called Because I'm a Girl. Mm -hmm. And why did we do that? Well, we did that for the very same reasons, I think, Leslie, that you put two years of your life into this extraordinary film um, because we know that globally um, what we've just seen, this isn't a random act of violence, you know, this is desperately, you know, awfully par for the course and that the, you know, absolutely, you know, endemic violence against girls and women is, mm. can I dare to say this, is normal. Mm. And, and that sort of institutionalised normality, you know, social norms that girls are not valued, that boys are brought up, brought up, you know, with girls who are less valuable, who are not valued, um, whether it's the, the milk, half a glass of milk, or whatever it is, or raped and being chucked off a bus as done with, done to, I mean, all of that. So, ah, uh, because I'm a girl. I think we've worked with about 53 million girls worldwide wow. in the last um, six years, mm -hmm. um, and it's never enough. And what I, you know, what I thought when I heard about what Leslie was doing is what, you know, what can we do? Yes. You know, how can we do the, if you like, the other bits, probably the, the sort of slightly quieter bits. We can't make the noise that, we're trying to make the noise, um, but how can we help work with girls and boys get sex education to schools get relationship education to schools get um, governments our own DFID Indian governments and actually it's everywhere it's not in one country it's mm. everywhere so what I you know our feeling was can we be part of moving the film and the message out uh, and to really change attitudes and change social norms that's what we would yes. like to do mm. I think we, we can perhaps try and, uh, and work out, um, you know, perhaps we can try and work out this evening um, how we can uh, make some progress and get some suggestions uh, in order to, to come up with solutions would, would be uh, one way forward. But I, I just, um, before opening up to the floor, I just want to bring Alistair in because um, the sharp in intakes of breath actually around the room at, at what the lawyers said um, uh, were, were very, very noticeable. I think that they were seen as a very shocking part of the film. Now, um, is that something, uh, Alistair, that you found uh, shocking, that the defence lawyers were making uh, those comments? I mean, weren't they entitled to? It had been a very um, fraught hearing. The client uh, had been convicted and then sentenced uh, to death. Uh, and obviously that particular lawyer was under a lot of pressure. So uh, wasn't he perfectly entitled to make those comments that if it was what his nearest and dearest, uh, he probably personally would set fire to them. No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to question. I mean, absolutely no excuse. Um, lawyers anyway, but by definition, are used to dealing with cases where the stakes are extremely high. So the fact that the stakes are high is, is neither here nor there, so far as this is concerned. In the UK, a barrister is under a duty not to bring the profession into disrepute. And even if you, well, say even, but if you are convicted, for example, of, of an offence such as drink driving, you would, you would suffer consequences, disciplinary consequences. I can't begin to imagine what would happen to you if you suggested that you would murder somebody uh, by setting fire to them if your daughter behaved in the same way as a victim in a case. I mean, it's utterly inconceivable. 
But when you were talking about um, what you can do to uh, prevent this sort of thing, what I'm very struck by is, is how important the rule of law is to all this. Mm -hmm. Because there are some statistics that uh, I've derived from the internet. Now, we all know that the, you know, the internet is not always right. But can I just give you some quotes here? New Delhi has the highest number of sex crimes among India's major cities, and that was, there was reference to that being the rape capital of India. Police figures report show a, a rape reported on average every 18 hours, and cases uh, increased by 17% between 2007 and 2011. Now, this is the real figure. Only one of 706 rape cases filed in Delhi in 2012 ended in conviction. One out of... Uh, 706 reported rapes. Now, if, if women see those stats, in other words, people are not convicted for offences when, even when they're reported, what is, what is the point of reporting them when they have to go through the trauma of trial and all the rest of it? So I think the rule of law is terribly important. And also, further stats, between the 16th of December and the 4th of January, 501 calls for harassment and 64 calls for rape were recorded by the Delhi police, but only four were followed up by inquiries. In other words, even when you report rape cases to the police, they don't do anything about it. So I think one thing, one thing that's terribly important is that, that, that if you, first of all, you should be encouraged to make a report of a rape when it's happened. But if you know that the police aren't going to take it seriously and not investigate it, and even if they do investigate it, the chances of conviction are, in effect, nil. Then surely, you know, this will go on and on and on, because men just will not be brought to book yeah. for sexual violence against women. Cathy, um, in relation to, to, to what Alistair said, um, I, I suppose concerning the conduct of lawyers, effectively he's saying, um, lawyers in this country, so to defence lawyers in this country defending people accused of rape, mm -hmm. you're not going to get that sort of behaviour. So it's fairly astonishing to see what's happening there. I mean, do you have any views on that? And also uh, with women, the ability of women and the confidence that women have to report rapes in, in this country. Do you, what, what do you think well, about I'm that? Well, I'm mainly here as, as an ambassador for PLAN to talk about how great PLAN are, you know, how hands-on they are. But I have just written this book that was based around the rape case. And when I was researching it, I read a lot of, through a lot of, um, you know, the court transcripts. And some of the British lawyers, the things they've said, were not so dissimilar to what we just saw. So we mustn't think this is a problem that's just over there in the developing world. I mean, I just took a couple of notes from, from real trial, from real cases, where the defence barristers portrayed the female victims as delinquent, manipulative, whatever. And one leading London lawyer recently asked a rape victim whether her so-called screams for help were really cries of pleasure. Another defence barrister described a child as sexualised and dangerous. He said she was glowing with hormones and very confident about her body's power and movement when she seduced a 50-year-old man. He said she played the game well and was, he claimed, a danger to men. He was describing a girl aged 11. I mean, there's endless examples I could give you along those lines. So I just think it's... You know, the other point, you know, when in, when they're always in court saying that the girl asked for it, you know, I think that, you know, compare that to a murder for a moment. You know, no one ever thinks maybe the murder victim wanted to die. Perhaps it was consensual death. But there is still this idea that it's her fault in some way. And it's prevalent in our society too. Yeah. Um, I, I think I, I will bring Alison back in on that because um, there the has been... Um, I don't know how old those cases are, but two years, two years ago, and there certainly has been uh, probably in the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. There was one particular case which hit the newspapers because of a comment uh, that was made in defence counsel's closing speech along those kind of lines. So I, I will bring you in to, to deal with that, but um, I, I also want to obviously bring in Maria. And uh, now, is this um, what we see here? I mean, is this something which? has always been there in India? Has it, has it, has it got much worse? Um, is it just an India problem that we're, that we're seeing? Well, as we've just heard from Kathy, no, it's not. It's not an India problem. Um, uh, rapes have got worse, yes. Um, there seems to be an, an escalation in rapes uh, since uh, about 25 years ago, uh, much more so than murders. 
but this is an unusual rape. I mean, rape is uh, a very serious and prevalent form of discipline uh, in India. And what's interesting about this rape is it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't follow a typical pattern. And I know that sounds very unpleasant, but most rapes in India are down. People rape down. Uh, and the uh, uh, first thing to bear in mind is this was a public rape by a stranger. That's not typical. Typical rapes are in private and they're by known assailants. Uh, so 97% of rapes are actually by known assailants and a lot of them are by intimate partners. They're within families and within kinship groups. Uh, there have been a couple of other notorious rapes, which have certainly not brought forth the, the protests that, that Leslie's rightly noted. Uh, but in the 70s and then again in 06, there were serious rapes against low caste women uh, by, by higher caste men. Um, and so there's a great deal, uh, as I try to, to say in the film, of, of um, policing social boundaries, policing social status here. Uh, and, and that's, uh, I think, the, in India, it's, it's highly bound up with that. And, and we've heard talk here that women aren't valued. I don't think that's quite true in India. I, I think women are valued in India. Uh, and, I, and I think paradoxically, it may seem to you, I think some of the people who wanted the film banned, uh, and, and I don't agree with them, but I think some of them felt genuinely that the rape victim was being shamed and dishonoured again. Uh, and that, and, and so they felt they were defamed. I don't think they all felt that. I think there was a lot of nationalism there, and they felt India was being defamed. But a lot of women actually wanted the film banned, and they wanted it banned because they felt that that, that Jyoti Singh's name was being dragged through the mud again. She was being shamed again. So there's still a problem of seeing the victim as the person who's been so dishonoured uh, by this crime that really the best thing, the kindest thing society mm -hmm. can do is is cover it up. Uh, and that is another reason why so many rape uh, accusations get dropped. Uh, you know, women get paid to drop the cases and their families put pressure on them to drop the cases mm. because it's felt to be deeply, deeply shaming for the women and deeply, deely shaming for the family. Yeah, it's very. Mm. Um, Alistair, just just a, a, a perhaps a quick point on any advances in this country in relation to uh, defence barristers uh, and how they deal with rape yeah. complainants in court. I'm not complacent. Uh, about the way in which the bar treats victims or, or people who are alleged to rape. Don't, you mustn't get the wrong idea about that. The bar is taking very great steps about um, tra training for vulnerable witnesses. And the bar, in fact, of its own motion, determined that it was necessary for, for every barrister who does these cases, whether prosecuting or defending, to be, to be properly trained in how to deal with vulnerable witnesses. So I accept that, that, that cases will occur, and the, the very fact that they're <coughs> reported means they're unusual. I mean, up and down the country, I can assure you that thousands of these sort of cases are being tried, and they're not reported for the reasons that, that you're suggesting, with these inflammatory and appalling comments. I'm appalled by these comments, don't get me wrong. Uh, w women who are alleging rape are treated with courtesy, dignity, and their cases are tested in a proper way. So I'm not saying there aren't things wrong, but we, what the bar is doing is trying to put this right. And there is a change in society. And comments like the ones that, or questions, and the sort of comment you're talking about, the only reason somebody's doing that is because they think it will appeal to a jury. But if, if jurors are appalled as we are by this, this sort of comment, then that's the last thing any defence counsel wants to be doing. And so I, I think... I think society is changing. I hope society is changing. I hope society is realising uh, how, how women uh, who are treated like this and violated like this behave. The whole way in which the courts treat these women is changing. Judges now traditionally, or, or, or in all cases where there is, for example, a delay in the, in the complaint, for example, which a lot of jurors in the past would say, well, if it happened to her, why didn't she complain straight away? But, but judges now, as a matter of practice, tell jurors that there may be very good reasons why a woman wouldn't complain immediately, for all sorts of reasons, and they do spell it all out. So I'm, what I'm saying is, times are changing. I was on a jury once, mm. and I think a lot of barristers don't understand that the average person doesn't know very much about the law. 
and it was a it was actually a sexual assault trial and the guy who was on trial was Kirk Reed and he was let off and he went on to commit a hundred rapes he's now the most notorious a rapist in in British history actually and we were misled by the judge who told us there was no forensic evidence so there was so we couldn't have, we couldn't convict him and when I got home and told this to Jeff this is back in the 90s he said but her evidence is is, is that, that her testimony is evidence that is evidence but we were misdirected by the judge judge G who later was uh, up on held, he went he was actually charged on he, he mortgage was. fraud. Can, can, can we just um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I don't have to wait too much. He was. He was. He was. He was. He was. I think, I think that the judge was very clear that he was not convicted. The point I wanted to make was that the prosecution, of course, the defence barrister was so good because he was making a reputation for himself. So he was, you know, firing on all, shooting from the lip and firing on all cerebral cylinders. But of course, the, the prosecution was lacklustre, you know, had the charisma of a bit of limp lettuce. And didn't, and also didn't make a, a do you call it a closing speech? Yes. Didn't make a closing speech, which the jury took to mean that he thought she was guilty because he couldn't be bothered right. to stick up for yeah. her. Yeah. So that was completely misinterpreted, wasn't explained to the jury, and of course they were, they just believed what the judge told them. Yeah. So, yeah. No, um, it's interesting. I think, I think, that, I think that's fine, because mm. you didn't talk about deliberations in the jury room. No, so I know you're loud. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah I think that's all. Perhaps we're going to open up for, for questions. Um, if I, can, if I can stack, so I shall start with Jeannie, she caught my eye first, and then we can go to John, and then behind John at the back, and then uh, two behind Jeannie, so, and then I'll come, I'll come over as well. So Jeannie, first of all. Um, this is a question for you. Um, as a practitioner, I've dealt with many um, sex cases and, and sex offenders, and one of the most marked things that I've found in my practice is that a sex offender, whether convicted or acquitted, will not talk in the way that that um, defendant did to you. Um, there's a closing down, there's denial, uh, there isn't a conversation about it. What do you think motivated him to talk to you as he did for, I think, 16 hours or something of that sort? Why did he do that? I think there was a practical motivation. <coughs> um, the stage at which I interviewed him, he had been convicted and sentenced. Uh, the appeal had not yet begun in the High Court. But I think he knew, given the public outcry against these six, um, his brother committed, well, allegedly committed suicide during the trial. Um, I think he knew that the chances of them getting off was so remote that he felt that in order to stand a chance of not hanging, he would have to um, rely on the plea of clemency because the appeal court was likely, um, the high court was likely to uh, uphold the original conviction and sentence, which indeed it did. The Supreme Court was then likely to uphold uh, uh, um, the High Court's uh, ruling, and that the only chance they stood would be clemency from the President, because there's a one month's window after the Supreme Court ruling. And I think he felt that if he, he said to me, uh, at the very end of the interview, 16 hours over three days. And at the very end, he said, thank you for that. I think television is my medium. <laughs> that is what he said. I think he really thought that that might help him. It might put a human face on him. Sadly, he is incapable of emotion. Mm. Now, I do not believe in the death penalty. <laughs> I don't want him to hang. I don't want anyone to hang. I actually think that there is a great danger that when they are hanged, if they are hanged, <coughs> it will kind of mask the real problem, which is these are not rotten apples in a barrel and you wring your hands with relief and you're done with them with a hand <coughs> because the barrel is rotten. Mm. And this is the problem. And I think he is incapable of emotion because he has been schooled 
by a culture and a society that tells him that this is fair game. The girl was out on the street after dark. So they thought she was a prostitute. He told me that. And, and his sense of absolute bewilderment, like a child, he was bewildered. Why are they picking on us? Yeah. Everybody's at it. Why are they making an example of us? Yeah, you can see that, in fact, yeah. in, the, in the film at different points. If I could just bring in John, John Stapleton, please. Uh, first of all, can I just say, Leslie, congratulations on a fantastic film. Thank you. Breathless. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. So um, what I wanted to know from either you or Maria, basically, was uh, what happened after the media left. I mean, uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm right yeah. in, uh, interpreting Alistair's comments um, about the number of convictions or the number of cases that are ignored, did the protest, worthwhile as it was, did it actually, are there any signs that it's actually started to change anything culturally in people's attitudes towards women, in people's attitudes towards rape? And the, the, the figures that Alistair was quoting would suggest not. But I, I've lost the chronology. I can't remember the chronology of, of what period he was talking about. But are there other signs, Maria, that things are getting any better? There are, there are good signs in that the um, number of rapes went up, of reported rapes went mm. up. I don't think that's because people think there was more rapes. I think they think it was because women felt that they could come forward and report them. Uh, some good things <laughs> happened in terms of legal reform. So the, the Verma Commission that we see discussed brought forth uh, a set of proposals which were extremely liberal and uh, some of them were passed. So, for example, it's a criminal offence for police to refuse to, to <coughs> register rape claims and to, to suppress their prosecution, uh, which it wasn't before. Uh, there's been a broadening of the definition of sexual assault. However, uh, that, that has been mitigated by the persistence of this strange honour-based uh, idea uh, uh, that, 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 that influences the approach to sexual crimes and also of dominance of familial power. So marital rape is still legal, it's not acknowledged as a crime. Uh, <coughs> sexual abuse of homosexuals and transsexuals is not acknowledged as a crime. <laughs> Uh, and the, the, the protest showed that there is the beginning of a 1968 liberal force <coughs> in India. Uh, uh, in terms <coughs> of other protests, not just about rape, but about other things. So it's undoubtedly the case that, that what you're seeing in India, I suppose, is what we saw in Europe in 68, an absolutely radical sea change in attitudes to relations between the sexes and hopefully between caste groups as well. Uh, but, but politically, it's an extremely... Uh, difficult issue. It's an extremely difficult issue. And so the Verma report, as I say, was diluted. Thank you. Uh, I think there's a gentleman at the back. Thank you. And yeah. then the <coughs> two here. Hi, um, Oliver Lewis. Um, I work in the mental health and uh, law charity. Um, so, first of all, thank you very much for making the film. Um, I've been going back and forth to India for about six years, so I know something about the context. Um, and I wanted to say something about the lawyers which is, of course, everyone <coughs> would agree that they're sort of medieval misogynists and how could they possibly uh, <coughs> represent uh, people who have, you know, we say deserve admonishment and, um, and the Bar Council of India uh, this evening, it was reporting on Gandhi just now, that um, they're looking into disciplining them. Yes, but, I will know that. <laughs> but actually then they're not, um, they're not, unusual in the fact that there's many religious leaders and political leaders who share exactly the same views as them. Actually, there's no jury trial in, in India, so probably their views put to a judge who may, I don't know who the judge was, but may share those views, may have been a very effective advocacy techniques, technique in the courtroom, which of course in, in the court of public opinion doesn't come off as so effective. So I don't think we should be <coughs> so critical of, to those lawyers because they just represent this incredibly misogynistic uh, view of male patriarchal society. Um, and just to emphasize your point, which is that this is a very unusual case and that most cases in this country and in India are between people who know each other and just in, in, in the, not just in the family but in institutions like mental health hospitals. There's been a recent Human Rights Watch a report um, it, uh, documenting incidences of violence against women uh, by other patients and by staff. Um, but I think uh, as much as there have been advances in this country with um, treating 
uh, people who have been victims of sexual violence. In India, the situation is going back after uh, Modi, Modi's government was elected uh, because we're seeing that NGOs now are subject to um, being re-registered uh, like they are in Russia and that I have many friends who are the directors of uh, human rights organizations there and they're very worried that in 13 months time, I think is the deadline, that they will just be de-registered and so many of the actual human rights heroes, unlike those trial lawyers, um, who can actually progress society will be silenced. Um, people are being forced to convert from Christianity to Muslim, uh, of Christianity and Islam to Hinduism. Um, so I just wonder what the panelists think the people in this room can actually do about any of um, uh, and any of the issues that we saw, uh, bearing in mind the political situation um, and this country's emphasis, well, at least the government's emphasis on economic development, uh, which um, somehow actually totally ignores the human rights development. Thank you. That, that's, um, that's an incredible question. <laughs> right. uh, thank you very much for the, for the, for the contribution there. If I can just, uh, just, just, just condense it a little and, and direct this um, to whoever wants to take it. Um, the lawyers, uh, perhaps not be too harsh, I'm paraphrasing a little unfairly perhaps, but uh, not be too harsh on them because they're perhaps representative of the male, the patriarchal society and all of those views are already held. Is there a difference with somebody who is in a professional position? Uh, are people more influenced by someone in a professional position uh, making that kind of statement? And does this also link to what's in the film where you had all these par parliamentarians also who have been <coughs> charged, accused <coughs> of uh, rape, robbery, murder, but those cases were fast-tracked? Is there anything that can be done about that? So we can throw that out. Uh, restriction on NGOs who perhaps could fight back uh, in the balance. Is, there a, is that correct? Is a, is there a clamping down on NGOs through uh, excessive bureaucracy? And uh, what's the solution there? Um, I, I'm going to leave the economic because um, I got a little <coughs> boss, forgive me, on the economic bit at the end. So who, whoever would like to go, perhaps start with Alistair on the lawyers and we perhaps can well, go back to Maria yeah, well, as well. well I, I was very anxious to check whether the lawyers were in fact in breach or potentially in breach of the code of conduct in India and they, they are actually. Uh, but what I'd understood, and in fact I rang one of the lawyers who's helping the family of um, Jyoti. And he, he told me that they were in breach of the Code of Conduct, but nothing, as I understood it, and this was yesterday, nothing had been done about them, nothing had been taken forward. Which seemed to me to chime slightly with the, with the fact that, that in India there are laws to prevent all this, they're just not enforced. Implemented, that's right. And it struck me that much the same with, with the lawyers in the case. Yes. They're in breach of the Code of Conduct on the face of it, mm -hmm. but nothing's been done about them. And I, I think this is a really important problem with it all. Uh, for the reasons I've earlier specified. Yeah. Um, Leslie. Can I please beg you here? You're, you're, you're so well placed to do this, and I beg you with all my heart to make this your contribution to this global campaign, which is what this film is designed to unleash. Mm. Okay. Thank you. C can I bring in... Um Sorry, can I bring in uh, Tanya, who's going to add to that, I yeah. think, on Plan thank UK? You. Um, thank you. I, I think it's really important that we um, don't get too demoralised, if you like, by mm -hmm. what feels like an almost overwhelming, you know, impossible mountain of social norms, <coughs> culture, and so on. I mean, I have to say, you know, I learnt some years ago, along with Plan, that we have to be terribly careful about accepting with a sort of, you know, long-suffering sigh that, well, it's, you know, cult other people's culture. And we've spent too long tiptoeing around mm. these mm. supposed cultural norms. And actually, the lessons from a lot of sub-Saharan African women we work with on FGM, against FGM, and in India, working with young people, actually, with adolescents against child-forced marriage, is we mustn't be too gloomy about it that actually there's really fabulous evidence, and we have some evidence coming up, that um, these cultural norms and social norms are changeable. It takes ages. But, but terribly important not to sort of, sort of say, well, you know, that we've, got it, we've, we've got all the law we need, but how are we going to change attitudes? Well, actually, attitudes are changing, and we now have villages which have decided to be 
non, you know, anti-FGM whole villages, <laughs> and there are places in India where young women and their young men friends and their friends have actually decided to fight back against child early forced marriage. So, you know, I do think we need to keep that yes. that little light I mean, burning. Maria, is, is that something that you agree with? I mean, how, how, do, yeah. how do you get the guys who are the parliamentarians? I mean, well, how do you, how do, you uh, deal with that? I, I say something which I'm sure will please everybody here. There aren't enough lawyers in India. Great news. I know it's difficult, right. it's di difficult to believe, but, but but actually, if you look at the number of lawyers and judges and police per head in India, it's mm. it's very very small compared with developed societies, and that's one of the reasons. One of the reasons that the criminal justice system is, is very, very slow. How do you exert leverage over the Indian government? I, I think that that, that that is something that probably, you know, um, Western societies have more chance of doing with a, with a government like India than they do with, say, uh, the Russian or the Chinese government, because India is very proud of its democratic reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that is something that, that, that we can use. Um, the other thing, and uh, this sounds appallingly cynical and trivialising, and I really don't mean it to, mm -hmm. but in the debates over the banning of the film, I'm afraid the word tourism came up Correct. several mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. several times. And since the rape, since the, the, the 2012 rape, India's tourist figures have tanked. They have right. tanked. Mm. And they are highly, highly sensitive to that. Uh, and so I, I think these, these sorts of things actually do give, give some, some ability to leverage the, the politicians. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can can I, I, I'll come back. I just want to bring in a few more questions because uh, we're running out of time very rapidly. So we've got you two being very patient. Uh, and so can over, over to you two and then we've got somebody in the middle over there and then at the back and then we might have run out of time I'm afraid. Hi Leslie, um, first I want to say it's a really powerful film and I'm sorry it's been banned in India and I think it has to be seen there. I just wanted to question your optimism on speaking to Modi and getting Modi to change his mind about this once he sees the film because there's actually a lot of evidence that he helped orchestrate mass rape and mass murder uh, against the Muslim minority in Gujarat in 2002. I know, and, yeah. mm. but that is backward looking. The thing is, it's we have to change this now. We've run out of time. It's enough. I'm not going to let my daughter, who's now just 15, live through this. It's not acceptable. So what we need to do is be optimistic. We need to look forward. We need to say, look at the man's statements. Just call him on it. Mm. He's a PR wizard. He went round electioneering mm -hmm. with 3D models of himself popping up. <laughs> God knows how he did it. But you know what? He has made these statements. Let's just say, come on. Mm -hmm. This is your chance to be a hero globally. Leslie, I also think um, <laughs> you know, his cases are still pending in the Indian justice system. So there hasn't been any justice on his role in the violence and his attitudes towards women and condoning mass rape against women. Mm. So I think this is also very relevant and also the fact that our government has a responsibility to push for this since we since we didn't really have a big problem in championing Modi um, when he was uh, a candidate to be prime minister. Tell him no, but then what is the, what, what's the solution to just say, well, it's not going to work with Modi and let's just, you know, maybe in after this election, after the next election, when we have a new, we've just got to try everything we can. And I am, I am optimistic because, you know, just look at how this campaign has divided people in India. And actually, we are now going way the other way. The gainsayers are dropping and the, there's optimism. There's yeah. got to be. So we can, we can certainly bring in, in, in more lobbying, which can be uh, in terms of something positive, which can be effective. And uh, I know we have a representative from... Uh, the human right, parliamentary human rights group here, uh, who maybe can make themselves known or can speak later. But uh, sir, you and then over there, and then we've got the lady uh, with the glasses sounding like, uh, getting into it now, you see. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm describing you with question time. And then, <coughs> sir, and then I think we will have to um, uh, complete. So uh, I have the same question as Sheena, who, by the way, has made an excellent film on Gujarat which yes. I would recommend, called Even the Crows. But that said, I had the same question that I think you're too optimistic, my personal view. Uh, the man is not just, uh, doesn't merely have this problem of uh, 
Gujarat 2002. But his record on the freedom of expression is terrible as well. Mm. So he's not your First Amendment specialist of the American kind, but First Amendment specialist of the Indian kind, which the Indian First Amendment actually restricts this. That may be, but in the same way as I couldn't sit at home and look my daughter in the face and say, I'm not going to go out there and do something. We, if we don't Indian try... Indian civil society, that's your ally, not Indian politicians. Well, okay, that's but Indian right. civil society. So, so you're yes. saying, you're saying, but why, why can't you do the both? Yeah, why, why can't you well, do both? Give it a go. Yeah, I'm and not if, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe I'm too pessimistic. All right. Anyway, we, 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 we have a pessimist, but we can work on you later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, uh, I'm sorry, over there, a lady over there yes, at the thank back. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll stand up. I'm, I'm a UK trustee. Hi, Tanya. Hi. Um, this little question that's sort of, you know, um, record, recorded in my mind, looking at the film, is what is it in the culture of India that, you know, that kind of idea of the or treatment of women is so pervasive and so endemic, mm -hmm. you know, that it, it's just, you just think this is 2014 and it's still so strong. And sometimes to find a solution, you need to understand what is it, what are the drivers? Are we missing something? Because I just cannot believe that in 2014, it still has such yeah, a... Yes, so, so in a way you're actually echoing what the Chief Justice, the former Chief Justice was saying was, you know, what sort of person could, would do this? And, uh, and also the different horrors which were also expressed. Can I, um, whoever would like to take that? I mean, Maria uh, has been uh, studying Indian history for some... Yes, or would you like to have a go? Uh, I think I think I'd give two answers to that. I don't think there's anything in Indian culture uh, that, that's that's particularly different from any other world culture. There are very conservative people there. It's still a predominantly peasant society as well, uh, and uh, the kind of conservatism you find there and the patriarchal attitude you find there are attitudes you will find in conservative societies. And let's not forget that you get very unpleasant gang rapes on American and British campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, and, and so, you know, it's not necessarily just to do with poverty and lack of education <laughs> either. It's to do with a set, a, a set of... A, a type of masculinity, I suppose, would be one answer. And it's, it, it is found a lot in India, but it's not only found in India. It's, mm. it's found in a lot of places. So I, I think I would say that for a start. But what I would say to you is, yes, as a historian, there are historical issues to do with India. The most important of which I think you need to realise is that India had a very, very traumatic uh, partition of independence, uh, which politicised religious identities in India deeply. Yeah. And the result of that, the way that was handled, has meant, for various reasons historically, that India does not have what is called a uniform civil code. <laughs> Uh, so women have not effectively had complete constitutional equality with men because of a political pragmatic decision that was taken early on in independence to try and uh, harmonise relations between religious communities after a very, very traumatic event. That blew up again in the 1980s with something called the Sharbano Affair, uh, in which Rajiv Gandhi attempted, well, gave in, in fact, to conservative Muslim lobbies, which wanted to change that and wanted to change uh, the laws affecting personal law for Muslim women to bring them into line with secular constitutional law. So that, it, it, the problem is that women's equality in the Indian constitution is deeply imbricated with issues of communal Communalism uh, and communal politics, which, as we've heard from the case of Gujarat, is, is by no means a dead issue in India. Uh, and so I think that uh, I, I would deny that there's a cultural problem there. I would say that there is an issue there that has to be understood historically. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, the lady there, and then I think so. You've got the fine. Well, I, I'm going to include Samo, <laughs> and then the gentleman. And then I think we, we um, will have to finish, I'm afraid. But thank you. I just want to know, comment on, on the uh, idea this is a cultural, Indian cultural issue. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry yeah. Yeah. Voice, it's, it's just the room's a bit weird. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just comment on the uh, last point about this being, and, and many other people, about this being an Indian culture issue. India's a very large country. And when I was 14 years old, I could roam the streets of Bombay very happily in all sorts of areas, safely. And I couldn't do that in London at the time, for sure. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a s small town. Well, I, had a, I studied in a small town for four years where I was felt perfectly safe. 
walking around with my, my girlfriends when I was uh, 14 and 15. So yes, it is a big problem in Delhi and it's a big problem in rural. It, it, there are pockets of problems, but this is, let's not say this is a problem of 1.3 billion people. And in terms of the reasons, uh, poverty, poverty really. Um, the people coming into Delhi, these men are all migrants. They were, every single one of them was a poor migrant. And what I loved about Leslie's film, what really rung out for me, was it highlighted that. It highlighted that these are young men, disenfranchised, have no other opportunities. Amod Khan, the brilliant uh, uh, child rights activist in India, he really put it very well when he said about the juvenile and how this boy, he was a victim as much mm -hmm. as Jyoti. And I sincerely believe that a solution here is looking at how young men even older men, how are they being treated when they come into these cities? And this is not, the, we can't underestimate this problem. Migration into Delhi, migration into the cities is only growing. Rural to urban migration, and they're all going into informal jobs, they're all poor. I think that is something that one needs to address here. If we want to address the problem of rape, if we want to address the problem of inequality and how women are treated, we need to think about how are these men, when they're coming into the cities, how are they being acclimatized? How are they being educated? Thank you. So, so obviously you, you're saying you can't, you can't cut out at all the socioeconomic situation. We, all, we saw there that 50% um, are below the poverty line in India. Thank you very much for that and sharing the experience. Yes, sorry, I can't, I can't not come in. I just feel very strongly that um, you know the the very highly educated, incredibly privileged lawyers that mm -hmm. we saw. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, this is not just a question yeah, of poverty is. and and peasantry. And the Tadelka editor. We don't have time to go through yes. all the examples of and stuff, but we, it really is not. That is not the issue. I mean, but, but if we also we, sorry, the other man we saw in that six was also her father her friend, the people leading the protest were also men. This is not where we don't, it's not that all men in India think that way. No, but nobody and would I think suggest that. that. The there were some extremely, that. I mean, you know, her father, her friends and so I just, the, the notion that this is to do with poverty is not, I don't well, think it's Poverty is one factor, isn't it? It's it must a be factor, one factor, but look at the lawyers for the defense. Who must, yeah. I mean, I don't know what level. The, the lawyers, uh, uh, Alison. Uh, in 2014, the Indian finance minister said, one small incident of rape in Delhi advertised world over is enough to cost us billions of dollars in terms of lower tourism. What does that tell you about the finance minister's attitude to a, yeah, an appalling offence yeah, like this? Correct. He's not poor. No. No. And also, and highly educated. Yes. As I say, and also, you know, rape has gone mainstream. You just have to put the television on any night and watch yeah. a laddish comedy show, and they'll be saying, oh, you know, I heard one the other night, what, what a nine out of ten people enjoy gang rape. You know, and the audience is laughing at that. Did you listen to any of the rap lyrics where they say, I want to smack my bitch up? It's not just a developing world problem. It's a global problem. But to say something positive, so we're not too, you know, optimism's not an eye disease. The great thing about PLAN and why I support them is that they are a hands-on practical charity helping young women all over the world. And when I was in Brazil, seeing what PLAN does on the, on the ground, and I was up in the favelas, the girls were being raped on the way to school. It was a five mile walk to school. So Plan built them a school in their village. And it's all about contraception, education, and nutrition. And of course, poverty for young for women is if they get pregnant. The way to break the cycle of poverty is to break the menstrual cycle. So if you can contracept young women, they can have a career and have a life. And Plan do that very subtly, just educating the women of every village and giving them access to contraception <laughs> and abortion. And that is a practical way to help all these young women. Practical. Thank, yeah. thank, thank you very you. much. Um, now, I had use over the glasses, then we had Samo, and then this is the final one. So I'm not a strict enough chair, this has to be the final one. <laughs> That's it then. Hi, yes. I just want to, uh, sorry, sorry, Handel, I'm a journalist and editor, um, and uh, I wrote a book, actually, a mini book for The Guardian after the gang rape. Uh, uh, on this issue as well. So I want to address two issues. One is about uh, education, the other one is about uh, a question that someone else raised about how do you help women in India. So so the first point was that actually I don't think that um, you know it's about education necessarily or, or, or the poverty as the lady said because I think it's more about attitudes. You know there are loads of poor people in India who don't go out raping women. Uh, you know and so it's it, you know it's agency and the attitude that they have 
that drives them to uh, dehumanize women in that way and then do those things. Um, so just you know, giving them more money or giving them a proper job is necessarily not going to make uh, change things around. Um, and the second point was about the fact that someone said, you know, how do we help um, women? So I don't think actually. <clears throat> One of the things I did was actually look at how whether women in India in richer states were less likely to be raped than women in poorer states, and there was no correlation actually. So it's not that if you, so in India the problem is that women are educated partly by their parents. I'm of Indian origin, by the way, uh, because they think they're going to get a better husband, not because they're going to end up being independent and being much more secure in life. Uh, so it's more the fact that if you want to help women in India, you should support charities which empower women to be financially independent, which seems to be the best way so they can run away from partners or they can live their own independent lives if they want to, if they're uh, harassed or uh, face domestic violence at home. Uh, for example, poverty amongst older widowed women is a huge problem in India too. So, um, yeah, so I would say rather than education, not that education is a bad thing, it's a good thing in itself, but I would say financial independence is probably the, the thing to focus on. That's very interesting, thank you. So it's all part of the empowerment of women, which is very good for International Human, uh, Women's Rights uh, Day, International Women's Day. Samo? Um, my name is Samo Shahal, I'm a lawyer, and I've done work um, in the UK, not as a criminal lawyer, but as a civil lawyer. Um, acting for women um, uh, in <coughs> criminal trials where the prosecution seek to have their medical records disclosed or to have them discredited. Mm -hmm. So that's the context in which I've acted for women in uh, rape and assault cases. Um, I thought it was a very interesting film. It's multi-layered, it's very complex. The issues that you're dealing with are incredibly complex. Um, it reminded me actually of The Act of Killing, which is a, a film mm -hmm. where, you know, the kind of mass murderer sits in front of the uh, TV screen and kind of discloses all. And you have that with the various defendants talking about why, you know, why they've acted in the way that they did. Um, and it's not untypical of Indians to want to sit in front of a camera. You've got all the families lined up and I thought that, you know, it was very interesting from the different perspectives. Um, I suppose my question is, um, you know, it has caused uh, obviously a massive storm, and that's given the film a lot of you know publicity. But what you know, what is it that we're intending to do with this film? What what is it that you're intending to do with this film? And what is it that UK plan hope will come out of this film? Because we've heard a bit about the reforms that the Indian government have you know attempted to um, achieve as a result of this you know massive tragedy. Um, and all of which is, you know, very interesting. But when, you know, there's a there's a kind of, you know, a role and a responsibility that lies with the filmmaker when they make a film like this, because it's not just about, you know, getting the publicity and the hype. And once we've all discussed and debated this, what are we hoping to achieve from this? And I just want. Okay, to so we have a website which is meant to be going live on the eighth. <laughs> okay, now, so what we are going to do with this website? is we have a, a Stop the Shame page. We're encouraging women to talk about their rapes. And we've already managed to persuade a few young girls and women to talk about that in India, which is really, really a big... Okay, we've got um, a, an action going with the government of Maharashtra, the board, education board of Maharashtra, who has pledged to allow us to make school packs and discuss, discussion guides for kids and take the film through their 189,000 volunteers to every single school in Maharashtra. That's 20 million kids. Now, of course, we're gonna have some issues because they've just gone and banned the film. But, you know, they will unban it. No, no higher court is going to keep to this uh, court order. It's just hasn't got a leg to stand on. So, but there are things like that. Shakti Vahini, very important. Shakti Vahini work with police and lawmakers and they have monthly training uh, sensitization ses sessions. So they have pledged to take our film and use that as a tool to sensitize police and lawmakers. And please, please, the Bar Council, join hands with the Indian Bar Council. Let us start taking some actual actions to discipline these men 
and you know to sensitize is that something that the bar council can do alistair yes <laughs> thank you <laughs> You know, really practical. Uh, we can't get to the dizzy heights of the bar council, Marissa, but what we can do is, in, you know, we have a programme, we're working with 350,000 young women in India. That, you know, it's a big country, it's a big population, but we do go to scale. And one of the things we now want to do with Leslie and with all, all the great supporters is actually work out how we can take the message, get sexual and relationship gender education mm -hmm. to schools. 350,000 girls is a good place to start. Yeah. You know, um, it's going to be more difficult now. I don't think taking the film out is going to be easy immediately, but we've got other ways of doing it. We already have um, an advert, advert with Credit Suisse there, a brilliant sponsor there funding us to give financial education. Where's Sunny? Sunny? Uh, financial education to young women. Uh, and we have a scheme to get young girls um, into their own independent financial security. Great, so, so that's that exactly the point is of where about. we would like to come in. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we've got the my, final question. My question was just answered. Has it just been answered? Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, well, thank you very much to all our panellists. Uh, thank you. <laughs>